Assistant Professor of Marketing, currently at the University of Oregon. Today I'm talking about how to use marketing engineering to predict customer behavior using choice models with marketing engineering software, the Logit model. The agenda, first I'll provide a brief introduction into what choice modeling is and how it's used in marketing applications. I'll transition into a personal application that I use to evaluate a loyalty initiative and then discuss the marketing engineering choice modeling case that's an assignment in my marketing strategy class. So what are choice models? Choice models are an analysis approach. They attempt to determine the impact of different marketing factors on customers' behavior. They're very popular. It's the most popular individual level response model in marketing. It uses past behavioral data to predict future behavior. There's no need to survey customers. You can survey customers and use survey responses as part of your model to predict behavior, but you could also just use available data in your customer relationship management database. So it infers what is important to driving customers' behaviors. And of most interest to marketers, it determines the probability of choices and the elasticities of marketing variables in terms of driving those choices. And it uses a binary or a multinomial logit model. Basically, that means we observe certain outcomes that are discrete. So either A happens or B happens. And that's the binary choice model. Or if there's potentially three options or four options or five options, we could observe one of those five options happening and try to understand what drives choices amongst options. That's the multinomial logit. An alternative way of modeling behavior is using a regression analysis. And those we use for continuous outcomes, such as the amount of money a customer has spent with us over the past year. Sales dollars would be a continuous outcome. It gives weights to the drivers of the outcome. So we could do an analysis of how advertising spending impacts sales dollars but it doesn't give a probability of a certain behavior happening it does not use the logit model so what is a logit model that is used in choice modeling the logit model helps us assess the impact of marketing on behavior and we can understand the marginal impact of a marketing action whether the marketing action makes a choice more likely or less likely that's the marginal impact being high or low. And you can see that the impact of a marketing action will depend on the probability of a customer choosing an alternative. Let's say one alternative is to stay with the company. That's going to be retention. Another outcome would be for a customer to defect or to leave a company. If a customer hates you and they're 100% guaranteed to leave, it won't matter what special loyalty initiative you do it won't matter how much you cut price they're definitely going to leave you and if they're for sure happy and they love you and they're going to stay you don't need to do a marketing action to try to convince them to continue to stay with you there's a very low marginal impact of a marketing action towards that customer so you could save your money to target customers who are in the middle so this assumes the customers make rational choices based on their individual utility and there's a diminishing sensitivity to marketing efforts. So the sensitivity to marketing efforts will depend on customers' propensity to do one action or another. So marketing has the highest effect on people who are sitting on the fence. So if a customer is not really sure whether or not they're going to stay with you or defect, those are the customers you might want to target with a marketing action. Let's compare this briefly to the conjoint analysis. So What's the difference between choice modeling and conjoint analysis? Both are used to model customer decisions and customer preferences. Now, some conjoint models do use a logit model. They do use um, choice behavior to 
predict how customers value certain options. But it's set up as an evaluation and it's set up as an experiment where the types of options that are evaluated are picked through the study design and it's basically done with lots of control. The researcher uses lots of control to have certain options evaluated and from those evaluations you can infer preferences. So you need lots of customer input, especially if you're looking for ratings from customers on different options. You don't need as many customers because it uses kind of an experimental design or an orthogonal set of attributes to have certain products be evaluated. You don't need past purchase behavior. You could have customers evaluate a hypothetical product offering and give their impression, their evaluation. It is appropriate for lead users. It's you know projected for innovation and the cost of doing it is relatively high. That's because you need to run it as a study. Choice modeling, we just observe behaviors. So there's no real survey necessary. There's no real high level of interaction with customers. We can just see what they do and track them in our database. We need a lot of customers to get accurate inferences. We need to have past purchase data. So we're going to correlate past purchases or past decisions to different uh, variables that we can use to predict whether or not a customer will choose option A or option B. It's not appropriate for lead users because it's backwards looking. You're assessing probabilities based on past behavior. And the cost is relatively low. As long as you have a customer database, you can take the variables for customers out of that database and match it with customer purchase behavior and use that to try to predict why would one customer continue to buy while another customer would defect. Or why would one customer buy option A and another customer would buy option B. So what are some common uses of choice modeling? Well, mainly it's used to target particular marketing actions to particular customers. How do you do this? Well, first you want to create a database of customer responses. So track customers' behavior and ideally track customer behavior over time. So what are, the, what are their choices? What are they actually doing? And you can do that with an experiment and a control sample. So perhaps you want to do a particular marketing action and see how effective it is to driving customer responses. You could have one group of customers get the marketing action and another control group not get the marketing action. So one might get a special discount. They could be the experiment group they use to assess the uh, special discount. Another group of customers might be left alone. They might be ignored. And comparing those two samples and the choices of the customers across those two samples, for instance, whether they continue to buy or whether they defect, then you can run the model and test whether or not that experimental variable was predictive of customer retention. Or you can look at prospects and you can see whether a certain kind of outbound marketing effort drives customer acquisition. If you can observe some customers clicking on your website and other customers ignoring it, or some customers clicking through and making a purchase while other customers look at something on your website but don't continue to make a purchase, and you have any other variables or information around them, maybe you've done an A-B test where you do two different versions of your website, you could use that data to run a model that would say, hey, which version of my website is most effective for driving clicks or driving purchases? You could also not necessarily do an experiment, but just look at historical data of past customer purchases. So I have a bunch of data on a bunch of different customers. Some bought, some didn't buy, some were acquired, some weren't acquired. Some bought the special version or the high-end version of my product, while others only bought the low-end version. And if I have that historical data and I can look at other variables on those customers, I can see what makes a customer likely to go ahead and do a certain behavior that I'm interested in. So then once we have our database, we model customer choices and we can rate customers based on their probability of success, whether they're retained, whether they're acquired, whether they buy the more profitable version of our product. We can look at the response to marketing efforts. So are, is one marketing effort more or less effective than another? And if we have four looking data, we can try to estimate the total customer lifetime value. Maybe you could look at the likelihood to acquire a customer, to retain a customer, to expand them, to get them to do word of mouth. 
And if you look at all those choices and you allocate a dollar amount in terms of the long-term profit you would make off that customer, given their probability of those different actions, you could give them a customer lifetime value score. And based on that score, you could target customers with the highest success rates, and you can target them with the most uh, effective actions and the highest returns. Now, as I said in the slide before, when you come to targeting customers, if a certain customer is guaranteed to be a good customer, they're definitely going to stay with you. They're easily acquired. And you find out that they're very likely to respond positively to whatever you're going to do, then you should go ahead and target them with that action. But if they're already so positive, such as they already love you so much that there's no way they're going to defect, there's no way they're going to leave you, then you wouldn't spend any marketing ex actions on them. You might save them for your customers that are on the fence. As long as that's fair and as long as customers who are your good customers don't see you treating kind of mediocre customers, treating them too well, and as long as it comes across as some fair method, then you can still keep your existing customers that love you and also sway some of your customers on the fence to stay with you. Okay, so let me talk about an application where I use the choice model to assess the impact of a particular loyalty initiative. So what is a loyalty initiative? There are customer specific investments. They augment the core offering. So they augment just the basic product that's get, that gets sold. And they aim to protect and expand existing customers' business. They're increasing in prevalence given the trend towards proactive engagement amongst companies. So there's a rise in continuous service providers such as Netflix or even Amazon where you do subscribe and save or different cloud companies, business to business, service as a solution. With all these companies, oftentimes you sign up your customer, you acquire them, and once you acquire them, you stop engaging with them until a particular problem comes up or they're thinking about leaving you or you're trying to sell them on some upgrade. But there's also been a rise in vice presidents and directors of customer engagement, customer experience, customer success. And the thought behind these new positions is that let's not wait until we wanna upsell a customer, or let's not wait until they're going to have a problem. Let's try to proactively engage with them through some loyalty initiative that gets them to use our product or service more, that gets them to be happier with it, it gets to lock them in to their loyalty and makes them predisposed to respond positively if we try to upsell them to a newer, better, high-end version of our product. So these customer engagement experience managers, they are given these budgets and they're supposed to go ahead and create these loyalty initiatives. And you can use a choice model to evaluate a loyalty initiative. And so just briefly, I checked the other day on LinkedIn and I found a whole list of companies that were trying to hire uh, heads of customer engagement, analysts for customer engagement, director of customer retention. All these directors and analysts would probably be doing choice models where they evaluate different customers on their likelihood to stay or be engaged or be willing to buy a newer, better version of a product. And hopefully they'd be using some type of choice model to assess whether or not their loyalty initiatives are effective. The problem with loyalty initiatives is they're very expensive. About $1.2 billion is estimated to be spent on them annually if you consider the employees that you have running them and assessing them and also just how much it costs to engage these customers proactively and try to make them more loyal. It's very expensive. And the effectiveness is unclear. So previous academic research have said we aren't really sure that they're worth the cost, that there's a positive response that outweighs how much we spend on these loyalty initiatives. And from that, there's still relatively little research informing whom to target. So which customers should we send these loyalty initiatives to? And so I did a research project working with a continuous service provider to try to assess the success of their loyalty initiative and also understand how certain uh, characteristics of customers make them more or less likely to respond positively to a loyalty initiative. And so let me kind of describe the study. 
And so you can get a sense of how customer engagement employees and analysts and directors can use a choice model to, to better allocate their marketing resources and be more successful at their jobs. Okay, so the study design. These were the inputs. I'll describe them in a second. And these are kind of the outputs or the behaviors that we observed. So in terms of customer performance, we observed three discrete behaviors that we would see certain customers do. They would either defect, these existing customers would defect and leave the company. They would maintain the status quo, so they would continue using and buying what they were buying before, or they would expand. They would add on to higher and better versions of the product service offering. And so those are three different outcomes. And we can look at what's the probability of any customer doing these outcomes as a function of their demographics and also any other variables that we have. Now, one of the variables or three of the variables that we want to look at were what we call intrinsic loyalty mechanisms. And so we gave each customer based on some information we had in their customer database a score for habit, being a low habit or a high habit. We looked at whether they were dependent or not, whether they were locked in through a contract and whether they had certain bundling um, savings. And dependence is thought to keep customers from leaving. And also a relationship, how long had they been a customer and how well did they kind of have an existing relationship with the provider. And that's also thought to limit defection. So all three of these kind of intrinsic behavioral loyalty mechanisms, we had a rating for each customer on all three, and we could use them to predict the probability of these different outcomes. And for instance, when we ran our choice model, we said, how likely is it a customer would choose to defect, choose to keep things the same, or choose to expand? We'd see that habit made it more likely an existing customer would choose the status quo, continue to do what they'd done before, and less likely that they would make changes. And some of those changes the company wanted to avoid, such as defection, but other changes the company was interested in seeing customers uh, do, which would be expansion. And dependence, we saw there's a strong probability of it driving a lack in defection, but not necessarily, it didn't make a difference between status quo or expansion. And so you can look at how any driver, any variable you have on customers changes the probability of a customer choosing a certain option. And so we used a baseline, a baseline period of five months to get indicators of customers' habit, dependence, and relationship. And we combined those with indicators of customer demographics, where they lived, how many people were in their family, stuff like that, um, to also predict the probability of them exhibiting any of these behaviors in the future. But then we combine it with the field experiment. And so after our five month baseline period, we did two months where customers got to use the service for free. But we only had half the customers get that loyalty initiative. And we wanted to see what the impact of that loyalty initiative would be on the probability of each of these outcomes. Would it sway the likelihood that a customer would be more likely to defect um, or less likely to defect whether they'd be more or less likely to kind of maintain the status quo or would they become more or less likely to expand. So we could assess the efficacy of this particular loyalty initiative on these different outcomes by having some customers get the loyalty initiative while other customers didn't. And by tracking that, who did get it and who didn't get it, and also observing these outcomes, we could look at the impact. Another thing we did is we looked at if it mattered whether or not the customer had a habit before, a dependence before, or a relationship before. And so we looked at the interaction between the experiment and their previous scores on all these different variables. And the idea being that maybe if a customer had a habit, they'd be more likely to continue to do the status quo. That makes sense. If they were kind of left alone but the loyalty initiative could potentially wake up the customers. It could make them more engaged with the product service category as you know the director of engagement hoped. But in doing so, if these 
habitual customers were woken up to consider what they want to do, you know, consider new alternatives other than status quo, you might see an increase in defection or expansion as even though they're happier that they got the loyalty initiative, they're now aware of maybe I should consider doing a uh, different option than I had done before when my habit first set in. And actually that's what we observed with our choice model. And so basically we observed what the outcome was you know, for an outcome period of eight months for these customers and all these inputs. And we're able to combine those inputs together and assess what the probability was of these different outcomes. And we could say, hey, you should target the load initiative to a customer that has habit and dependence because the dependence will keep them from defecting and the load initiative will wake them up and they'll consider expanding. And so that was some of the takeaways we had for the company, for the customer engagement program through the loyalty initiative. Okay, so let's talk about the homework assignment you have with marketing engineering. It's a relatively straightforward and simple homework assignment. I'll introduce it and then I'll go ahead and show you how to do it. So it's the Bookbinders Book Club and it's a direct marketing exercise and it uses choice modeling to assess who will be most likely to purchase the art history of Florence, a particular book. So according to, oh, first of all, these are pictures of me when I used to live in Florence. So unfortunately, these pictures were not in the art history of Florence. So that's why many customers did not buy the book. But getting back to this um, homework assignment, it includes this quote that says, according to Doubleday President Marcus Wilhelm, the database is the key to what we are doing. We have to understand what our customers want and be more flexible. I doubt book clubs can survive if they offer the same 16 offers, the same fulfillment to everybody. And that just captures the idea that customers are different. Some customers will be more inclined to buy a particular book than others. And with that philosophy in mind, we can do a choice model to see which of the bookbinders book club customers will want to buy the art history of Florence. And we can try to look at what marketing actions the company might do to make it so people would be more likely to buy that book in the future. So what happened? Bookbinders Book Club mailed a specially produced brochure that solicited purchases of the art history of Florence. So they had all these existing customers in their book club and they sent some a special brochure on this particular book and said, would you like to buy this book? Now, sending that brochure, you know, there's mailing costs, printing costs. So there's costs involved. And so you only want to send it to the customers that are you know, highly likely to buy it. And if you have a choice model, you can predict which customers are likely to buy and which customers are not. So they put together a data set of a small group of their customers. And in that data set, 400 customers purchased the book in response to the mailer. Well, where 1,200 did not. And the idea being, if we can find out which customers are most likely to buy the book, then we can go ahead and target the customers who are most likely to buy, where the amount of purchases will offset the cost of the printing and the mailing of the brochure. Okay, sorry, I had to shift this slide around because I had an overlap in some of the text. So anyways, 400 customers purchased, 1,200 did not. Let's predict, uh, let's use a model to assess the likelihood that a customer purchased the book as a function of 10 predictor variables that they have in their data set. So what are the variables that they had? They knew the customer's gender. They knew the amount of money that was spent on Bookbinder Book Club in the past. They knew the frequency that the customer bought books over a certain time period. They knew how long it had been, the months since last purchase, and how long the person had been a customer. Um, so how long, how many months had been since their first purchase. They also knew the number of purchases in five different categories. So there was an art category, a children's category, a do-it-yourself category, and two other categories of books. And they were able to look at how many purchases a customer had done by book category. From that information, they were able to see how these predictor variables related to the likelihood to buy a book. So if a customer had 
was male versus female, how would that change the likelihood that uh, the customer would buy the history of Florence, the art history of Florence, and all these other variables, how those variables would impact the likelihood of a customer purchasing this book. And so the implications of that information, once you run your model and you assess how these predictor variables um, impact the probability a customer purchases the book, is that you can target certain customers that are most likely to buy the book. And I'll show you how to do that. Or you could use it in your forward-looking strategy to try to change what you try to do. So for instance, if you really wanted to kind of reposition your company around art history books or Florence books, let's say these were high margin uh, products for you, you might try to recruit customers with a particular gender, or you might try to retain customers if that month since first purchase is really important predictor. You know, depending on what predictors are important, you could design marketing actions that would try to influence your customer di your customer portfolio in terms of how they rated on each of these variables. And so this last slide I'll show you before I get to the case. This is not something you have to do in the case, but I just want to show you the impact of using a choice model. So you could apply the results to a holdout sample and you could evaluate models and optimize profits. This is kind of direct marketing 101. And what I did is I ranked customers based on their predicted likelihood to buy the book. And I put them into deciles. So I basically sorted customers in a holdout sample based on their predicted likelihood to purchase the book. And then I looked at what percent of customers in that decile actually did purchase the book. So using the logit model, that's what this MNL stands for. I see that in the customers who scored the highest on their predicted likelihood to buy the book, 37% actually did buy the book. And I could also do a regression model on the same variables and regression model performs a little bit worse where only 35% of the customers in the top 10% of customers purchase the book. If I add another 20% of customers that were ranked high on their likelihood to purchase, then I get up to 49% of all customers who ended up buying the book versus with the logit model, it captures 53% of all customers that purchased the book. And the more and more customers I include based on the rankings, eventually I get to 100% of the customers that did purchase the book, even though each of them represent a smaller and smaller chunk. You can see down here, I have the total number of customers that purchased the book based on their probability score that they would purchase the book from our model. And the slope is such that at first, the more customers I include, the more and more customers actually purchased the book, but eventually, you know, these are customers who are predicted not to purchase. So very few of them actually did purchase. So I'm comparing predictions um, in terms of their predicted likelihood by their actual behavior. And with the logit model, it's slightly better for predicting who bought the book. Then also, if I do some assumptions based on like the profit margin, taking into consideration how much it costs to mail, and um, how much money I get from selling a book, I can see how much money I make changes as a function of how many customers I target the mail into. And basically this model says that I can maximize my profits if I send 70% of the customers the mailing and I should send it to the top 70%, the 70% that are predicted as most likely to purchase the book. And that's what maximizes profit. Now, that's just the straight up cash numbers. One thing I want to emphasize in this class and everything we do is beyond these numbers, and I love these numbers, I want you guys to have an analytical approach to decision making. But beyond just these numbers, there could be other factors that would make you want to send these mailers. Perhaps you would send it to all 100% of your customers and you would be okay with your profit margin on this particular product going down if, for instance, you thought it helped raise your brand awareness to customers, or if it helped reposition you in a strategic part of the market 
for instance, maybe you're very much interested in being seen as providing this type of book, whether or not a customer would buy it or not. Or maybe you want to send it out because you find in a different analysis that if customers get hit with a mailer at one period in time and don't buy it, then they're more likely to buy a product in the future from a different mailer. And so if you have a long-term view, it might begin to make sense to target more of these customers who have a low probability of buying. So the pure simple look would say, hey, target about 70% of the customers because you have diminishing returns of this marketing effort of sending the mailing. But you know there could be other strategic reasons why it would make sense to go ahead and do this. So this is the power right here of doing these type of models, whether it's a logit model or a simple regression model. Usually you wouldn't use a regression model for something like did they buy or did they not buy, but I just did it to compare and show you that even doing the simple regression model can make you more effective as a direct marketer. All right, so let me go show you the case and then you can get some additional insight into how to do it. Okay, so this is our data set. And first you wanna orient yourself to the data set. What we have is this choice variable, which basically says one, did the customer buy? Or zero, did they not buy the art history of Florence? We have their gender, one and zero. You'll need to look up what does one mean? Is that male or is that female? And what is zero? Amount purchased, how much money have they spent? Frequency, how many books did they buy over a certain time period? Last purchase, how many months since their last purchase? First purchase, how many months since their first purchase? And then the number of children books the customer has bought in the past, number of youth books, number of cookbooks, number of do-it-yourself books, and number of art books. So looking at all this information, we can use it to predict um, choice. So we use all of these variables, customer data that we have to predict whether or not they actually bought the book. And this data set has been sorted in such a way that all the customers at the top have chosen to buy the book and all the customers at the bottom have not. It doesn't have to be sorted in that order, it's just the way that this data set is set up. Looking at the bottom, I'm hitting shift and arrow down, and that highlights all the customers in this data set. You can see there's 1,600 customers, and uh, about 25% of them, or 25% of them, purchased the book. And we can find that out by you know, doing an equals average, and just summing up these values. And I have to go up to the top to find out which number it is at the top. Perfect. So yes, 25% of customers bought the book and we can look at other variables. So about 66% of customers in our data set have the gender that corresponds to number one. $200 is about the average amount of money that customers have spent. I forget what all these variables represent, but you can get a picture of um, what's the overall sample. You don't need to do this calculation because it's part of the results set when you run the choice model. So how do you run the analysis? It's super easy, at least for this simple model. You just go to customer choice, load it, and run analysis. First column contains respondents' IDs. More than one case per respondent would be if you had customers that made choices over time. So, you know, if you had whether or not they bought the book this month, next month, in the third month, the fourth month, the fifth month. For instance, if you had lots of different um, inputs for customers of a choice, then you could have more than one case per customer or per, per respondent. And more than one alternative per case would be if you had not just did they buy, did they not buy, but did they buy brand A, brand B, brand C. Well, in this case, we just have they either bought the book or they didn't buy the book. Generate alternative specific constants. 
you can do that or not. It doesn't really matter. I don't necessarily want you to interpret them, but that just basically says uh, how likely is it a customer does not buy versus how likely is it that a customer does buy. Significance level in terms of looking for significant predictors of whether or not a customer bought the book. Typically, we want to know things that are significant at the 5% level of error. So if it says it's significant, then we can be 95% certain that the predictor actually drives likelihood of choosing to buy the book or not buy the book. You can also perform an analysis on a holdout sample. If you have a holdout sample, to answer the questions in the case, you do not need to look at the holdout sample, but uh, I did post one on the Blackboard that can help you see how you would use the results in a direct marketing campaign. So don't click that. And latent class options is if you want to combine this analysis with a segmentation analysis. And the segmentation is based on like how much the amount of purchased impacts choice. So it uses the relationship between these variables and choice to categorize customers in segments. We can't do that in this case uh, because we only have one response per customer. But it's pretty cool that this software allows you to do a segmentation with a choice model if you have the right data. And then next steps, it just asks you where your data is. So we click next. We make sure that it's highlighted the right data range, the right cell range. So we just scroll down and make sure it's all captured. And it is, so we click OK. And now at this point, it's <laughs> very easy. We just go ahead and look at what are the results. We try to interpret the results and try to infer what we can do as a marketer with the information we gain. So response probability is just the probability that a customer would go ahead and buy the book. So for this particular customer, they said there was a 14% chance that they would buy the book. And given that, they predicted that this customer would not buy the book. But in actuality, the customer did buy the book. The observed response was that they did buy the book. The dummy is just what the predicted dummy, dummy, dummy. All those are just the opposite. It looks at the likelihood that a customer would not buy the book. So if you wanted to frame these results in terms of the negative, uh, then you could use that information, these columns, to kind of describe what happens. Out of 400 customers, so remember 400 customers bought the book. And of those 400, we, actual, we accurately predicted 160 of them. So we could do equals this divided by that. So we can say we were, is that right? No way. Oh, I did the wrong number. So we were able to predict the customers would actually buy the book correctly 40% of the time. That's not an awesome number. But if you look at predicting whether they did not buy the book, let's see, we got that much more accurately. And so, yeah. So of the 1,200 that didn't buy the book, we were basically right 93% of the time. I would have to change it. 93% of the time. And so the, the key value as a direct marketer is Basically, if you ignore these 1,120 people, you won't, make, you won't waste money on mailing them requests to buy the book if they're not likely to buy it. And so that could save you a bunch of money. And as long as you made a high enough margin off uh, the sales of these 160 people, then, you know, hey, hey, that's great. You can cover the cost of mailing it to 240 people that don't buy. What we can look at here is the averages for each variable. This is the overall total average. So about 60% of people had their gender as being a number one. And then you can also look at how these averages change by whether or not they bought the book or whether, yeah, whether or not they bought the book, the response, or whether they did not buy the book. 
the dummy, the no choice. And you can see that some of these variables differed by quite a bit, or others didn't differ that much. And from that, you can kind of get a brief sense of whether or not those variables are predictive of choice. But those aren't the most kind of accurate way of understanding the relationship between the variables and choice. The most accurate way is based on looking at these variable coefficients and also at the elasticities. Now let me talk through those real quickly. So if something is highlighted, either red or green, that means it was significant. It means that we can kind of have a lot of confidence that these variables predicted the likelihood a customer would either buy or not buy the book. And so we see gender being negative. And so that means if a customer had their gender being a one, let's say that was male, they'd be less likely to buy the book. If they had spent a lot of money in the past, then they'd be more likely to buy the book in the future. Now these are just saying, how do these kind of variables relate to likelihood to buy the book and whether or not they're significant. But to interpret the size of the impact or the size of the prediction, we wanna look at elasticities because these numbers are swayed based on the variable that was used. There are very few people that had purchased an art book or a do-it-yourself book. These numbers were typically between like zero and three where amount purchased was up in the 200 was the average amount purchased in the past. And so the coefficient is very small for amount purchased and comparatively it's very big for these other variables. And that's not really a fair comparison because it's not normalized to a kind of standard unit. Elasticities are normalized. Basically it means if this variable increased by 1%, then what would be the impact on the likelihood a customer would buy the book, the response. And it doesn't make sense to say gender increased by 1%, but you could say gender increased by 100%. And so you could take that and multiply it by uh, this variable. But basically, when you get to these percentage relationships, you can say that it's a normalized value. So you can compare how gender is different from amount purchased. And in this case, gender has a higher value, an absolute value of 0.27 than uh, amount purchase, which is 0.21. So a change in gender is more kind of predictive of choice than the amount someone spent in the past, even, even though they both matter. And they matter in different directions. If someone is a one, then they're less likely to buy the book than if they're a zero for gender. And if they spend more in the past, if they had a higher amount purchased, then they're more likely to buy the book in the future. Okay, we talked about this estimation already, where it says, what's the probability of response? I'm going to show you now in the holdout sample how to calculate this value. And so let me go to my holdout value, holdout sample. Okay, so basically I copied and pasted, I'll have to move this over. So I copied and pasted the variables and their coefficients. And I'll show you how these values relate to the predicted likelihood a customer will buy the book. So I, I moved these coefficients to try to correspond to these values. So gender had a coefficient of negative 0.86. Amount purchased had a coefficient of 0 0.0019. And what I can do with this holdout sample is I can see how useful our model is for predicting behavior in a holdout sample. So I observe their choice. I observe their gender, the amount purchased. I observe all their data on all these variables. And what I can do, if you go ahead and look at this spreadsheet online, you can see the formula. First, you look at their attractiveness. This is just a name of a score using a logit model. But it's basically the exponential of the intercept plus the coefficient for each variable times the value for each variable. So, so the coefficient for D5 times the value in D7. That's what you see right here. And you add those all up and you take the, expo the exponential of that number. It gives you the attractiveness score. And if you take that 
score divided by one plus that score, you get the logit score, which is the predicted likelihood the customer will buy the book. And I did a little equals if function here, and I said if this value is above 0.5, then say that they're a one that we predict they will buy the book. And if it's below 0.5, we'll make it a zero. And so then I do an accurate and I compare their actual choice versus their predicted choice. And I can see if that is the same, I give myself a score of one, say my model is accurate. And if it's a score of zero, I say it's inaccurate. And so I can do a lot of info, I can do a lot with all this information. I could do a sort or I sort customers based on their logit score, basically their probability of buying the book. And I can go ahead and target customers in the highest probability and I can compare if their predicted choice and their actual choice corresponds so I can get kind of a hit rate by deciles. That was what I showed you in the PowerPoint slide. So if I sorted all these customers by their logit score and I grouped them into deciles and I compared for each decile their predicted choice versus their actual choice, I could see how accurate I was and go ahead and assess at what point should I stop targeting customers with the mailer? And I can also do some assessments of how accurate my model is by comparing if the predictive value corresponds to the actual value. All right, that's all I have for you on choice models. I hope that you found this to be an interesting and illuminating video that helps you see the value in using choice models to understand why customers exhibit certain behaviors. And then from that, you can look at, okay, as a marketer, how can I use this information to target particular customers or change my marketing efforts to redo what I do as a company and also who my customers are such that I'll be more successful in the future. Okay, I'm out of here. Have a great day. Good luck on your homework. Bye.